Well, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thank you. This is awesome. Um, I, I was looking at this, you know, obviously it's like every seven years, Christmas Day falls on a Sunday, but then when you throw a leap year in, it gets to be like 11 years. So there's long periods of time where we don't have this opportunity to celebrate Christmas Day on a Sunday. So this is kind of a cool thing. And I am going to keep it short this morning. I just want you to know that I, I'm thankful to be able to spend this time with all of you. I think it's great that, that you all made it a priority to come here this morning, and I know that a lot of us have different things going on this afternoon. Um, so I, I'm going to keep it short, but I want to share kind of what God has laid on my heart as I've been anticipating uh, Christmas Day here. And just so you know, even if you look at your bulletin, it's not going to look like one of the traditional messages that we have here. It's going to be much shorter. And it's going to be almost more of a devotion style uh, and kind of just give you some things to reflect on. Um, I just want to leave you with a few things to ponder and to discuss as you go on about your Christmas celebrations this afternoon. Um, so that's kind of what it's going to look like. It's going to be a lot shorter and, and less structured maybe than, than what I normally do. So let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this morning and this time that we can gather together to celebrate Jesus. And Lord, we just thank you for sending your son, and, and today we celebrate his birth, and in and, and just a few short months we'll celebrate the resurrection that just completes that mission that you sent him on, the, the mission of God to redeem us, to save us. And so God, today help us to just focus on you in everything that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. So as I was thinking about this opportunity, because this for me this is just like, this is an opportunity, right? I've got you here. It's, it's Christmas Day. What can I talk about? And I thought about a lot of the things we could talk about. We could talk about the shepherds and uh, we could talk about their journey and how it is that they came to where they were in the story. And we could talk about the wise men. We could talk about the evil plan that Herod had. We could talk about all those things. We could talk about how God communicated to them and how he protected Jesus in that. Um, I could talk about the manger and we could talk about the journey. We could talk about the events of the lowly, humble birth of the king of kings. We could talk about all of those things. Um, that's actually what my family will be doing later today. That's been our tradition for years to just kind of read through Luke chapter 2 and, and talk about that as a family and what that means and what that looks like. We reflect on the birth of our Lord and Savior. Um, but I just, this is going to be maybe a little bit strange, but I just want to go back one step from that, just a little bit further back. I want to look at the parents. I want to look at the parents today. I want to look at how did they hear of this, this birth? How did they process the news? How did they walk through this interruption of their plans? I want to look at that and see what does that mean for us today. So this is a shocker, but when Kelly was pregnant with our first child together, she actually found out first that she was pregnant. Okay? She knew before I did, right? And uh, so I came home, I had been out ice fishing, I still remember this, I had been out ice fishing and I came home from ice fishing and when you're ice fishing you just, you got to wear a lot of layers of clothing and stuff like that and there's always all kinds of stuff to put away. So I got home and I was putting gear away and, you know, going through all this stuff and it was just another day for me and she was kind of following me around a little bit, you know, and I thought, well this is a little different, but Okay. And uh, eventually, you know, when I got into the house, I was hanging up coats and all this stuff, and then I made it down. I was going to take off a bunch of my layers and stuff, and she followed me in, and she showed me this little plastic thing. I said, oh, what is this? And then there was, there was two lines on it. And I said, oh, okay, I get this. All right, so she has already, she's already seen this, right? She didn't reveal this at the same time. So, of course, we were excited, and we started talking about all the preparations that would happen and how we would have to, we had a spare bedroom in the house, but now it's going to have to get like painted and decorated and remodeled and all these things, right? And we got to get all the toys and we have to get all the diapers and the gizmos and the gadgets and all the stuff that we use to raise kids nowadays, right? So we started talking about all that stuff and then we started looking at the calendar. Oh gosh, okay, it's this time of year now. When is this little boy or little baby going to come along and, and all that stuff? So we were really like, it just switched gears for us, right? So, so I thought it would be appropriate since typically the woman will find out first that she is with child um, that we're going to look at Mary first, okay? 
we're going to look at how the parents of Jesus processed what was happening. And we're going to start by looking at Mary when she found out that this baby was coming. So you guys are familiar with this story, but I'm going to recap. God sends uh, an angel to talk to a young woman. This young woman is engaged to be married. And the angel tells Mary that she is favored by God and that she's going to have a baby. But, but this is not just any baby. This baby will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. But there was a problem. Mary encountered an obstacle as she receives this news. She had an obstacle. She's a virgin, and she's curious, how is this going to take place? How can this be? So the angel goes on to explain how this is going to happen. In Luke chapter 1, verse 35, And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. So Mary has this obstacle as she receives this news, and God provided an answer for her how this was going to happen. She had reservations about the news. God gave her peace in the confusion. I love Mary's response in verse 38 of that same chapter. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Submission. Submission, simple and profound at the exact same time. Simple and profound at the same time. Saying yes to something that would have great implications on her life from that day moving forward. Her response didn't only affect her. That submission didn't only affect her. It affected the man she was engaged to as well. Her obstacle was one that defied everything that we know about science and nature. It defied everything we know about that. And her obstacle, though it seemed large to her, was small compared to the plan that God had. So Mary had to choose. Mary had to choose. Do I trust what God is doing? Do I surrender to Him and his plan that he's revealed for me. Do I submit to God at the cost of everything else? Matthew chapter 1 is where we get to see this from Joseph's perspective. Joseph discovers that the woman he is engaged to is already pregnant. That's how he learns this news. He discovers that she's already pregnant. And in this culture, a couple would be considered to be married uh, perhaps up to a year before they were actually married, before there was a ceremony. Marriages were typically arranged in this culture and time. A bride price was paid to the family. But it might be, again, up to a year before there's a ceremony for that marriage. At that point, then the marriage would be official. So the problem here, there hadn't been a wedding yet. There hadn't been a honeymoon yet. So Joseph had an obstacle. He had an obstacle as well. Joseph begins to process this information. He takes this information in and he starts to weigh out his options. How will he handle this obstacle that he has? As we read in, in Matthew chapter 1, we see that two things are true about Joseph as he encounters this news and processes through this. Even though uh, he was engaged in what was likely an arranged marriage. He cared for Mary. We learn that about him, that he cared for Mary. He wanted to preserve her dignity and, and actually, in that culture, probably preserve her life. And we can also see that Joseph didn't believe her story. Not at first. He didn't believe her story. So as he's going on, he's trying to decide how to handle this situation. Weighing all these options out. Preserving the dignity of the woman that he was set to marry. Trying to figure out how he can overcome this obstacle without dragging her through the mud. And again, potentially saving her life. So he decides, like any man will do, I'm going to sleep on this. I'm going to sleep on it. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Joseph had this obstacle. 
This would disrupt the plans that Joseph had made. This changed his plans. It wasn't what he expected to happen when he became engaged to Mary. This isn't how it was supposed to be. Would anyone believe this story? Was this going to bring shame on him and his family? Just like Mary had to make a choice, Joseph had to make a choice. We see his choice in verses 24 and 25. When Joseph woke from, woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Joseph also gives us this picture of submission. And again, I'm saying this is simple and profound. Submission that's simple and profound. Submitting what he thought he knew. Submitting his feelings about what he believed. He allowed God to change what he believed about Mary and about the situation that he found himself in. We celebrate the birth of Jesus today. The birth of Jesus is the most significant event in all of history. Nothing has ever nor will ever eclipse that day. It's the incarnation, God coming and taking on flesh. This was an interruption for his earthly parents. They had obstacles to overcome. This was an interruption for the religious people of the day. They had obstacles that kept them from realizing Jesus is the Messiah they had awaited. The incarnation is an interruption for you and for me. The incarnation comes into our lives as an interruption. Jesus calls us out of what is comfortable. He calls each one of us out of what is comfortable, what is easy. This is the interruption that trades our will for His will. It's the interruption that takes us off of the throne of our life and puts Him on the throne of our life. Now, you may not get a visit from an angel. And God may not communicate with you so clearly in a dream. But there is good news that God has spoken. God has spoken. And we all have access to every word that God said. So, this is what I want to leave you with today as we celebrate the birth of Jesus. This is what I want you to contemplate today and tomorrow and the next day. This is what I would like you to discuss with your families this afternoon as you gather together. Simple questions. Two questions. What has God already told me? What has God already told me? How have I responded? How have I responded? That's your dinner table conversation this afternoon. What has God already told me? How have I responded? I have used these words simple and profound to describe the submission that Mary and Joseph displayed in this situation. So what would simple submission look like for you today? What would simple submission? What has God revealed to you that that you have an obstacle in getting to? What's the obstacle that you have? What is the obstacle for the plans that you have, for the road that you are on? And how can God use your simple submission to bring about profound changes in your life and in the kingdom of God? Jesus did not come to keep the status quo. He just didn't. He didn't come to make sure that everything went exactly according to our plans. That's not why Jesus came. These familiar verses from Proverbs 3 are so familiar to so many of us and we lean into them. Verses 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. 
In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. So, again, I'm keeping this short today. I'd love to go on for a long time. Most of you know that already about me, but he didn't come here for that. So let's take a lesson from Mary and Joseph. Let's let our obstacles and our plans crumble in front of Jesus in a picture of simple, profound submission to what he's already told us. Let's submit to his plan. Let's let him bring a holy interruption to our plans. Let's trust him. And maybe today, maybe today that starts with trusting him for salvation. Maybe today as all of the buzz, all of the discussion is around Jesus, maybe today is the first time you realize that you haven't trusted Jesus for salvation. And maybe this birth of a Savior, you don't understand what that means. And maybe for you, it's a simple submission that has profound implications on eternity. It's a simple submission to recognizing the finished work of Christ on the cross. Turning in that sin that separates you from a holy God. In repentance, you turn from the sin and turn towards God. And as we talk about giving and receiving gifts so much at Christmas, you have the opportunity to receive the most important gift you can receive, that free gift of salvation that's only available through Jesus. I told you I was going to keep it short, and I'm going to. I think we would have a large ripple effect for the kingdom of God, even if just our little church began to submit with simple submission to what God is calling us to. And that, ri- that ripple goes out from this church. It goes out from each one of your families, each one of your homes into this community. Simple yet profound submission is what I want to leave you with today. I'm going to have the worship team come up. I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you come in and interrupt our plans because, God, our plans aren't good. Yours are. So we thank you that your plan, we can know that your plan is good. We can know that your plan is the plan of of winning, that, that your plan wins in the end, Lord. And so help each one of us here to process this idea, what have you already told us and how have we responded? And God, I again pray that you would even just use this little church here to start that ripple effect in our church, in our homes, in our community, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our families, that as we begin to hear your call, simply submit to your call, responding to it, that we turn that over to you, that we trust you, that we don't worry about if we understand or not, but God, that we just acknowledge that we are following the path that you have put us on, and then we stand back and watch you work, and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.